everybody, Craig Shacklett from URCompt here. I have got a very special guest. We have Julia Carcamo. She is the president and chief brand strategist at J. Carcamo & Associates. So as a little background, she's author of Real Marketing, and she's also a senior marketing leader focused on equipping brands and future marketers with the tools they need to succeed, especially casino marketers. Thank you so much for being here, Julia. Thank you for having me. So before we get to your background, because I think it is super fascinating, and we, before we got on camera, I was already like kind of blowing the interview by asking you so many questions. So I want to get to your history in a minute. But first, why don't you tell us about what you do through Jay Carcamo, helping different casinos and other brands? So um, my passion has always been around um, advertising and marketing and um, I got into this casino industry and so that's kind of where we we really focus although we do have a few clients here and there that that are not casinos but for the most part we work with um, casino clients to do some internal branding uh, branding as a whole uh, creative services of course and then we um, more recently started casino marketing boot camp so that's um, our kind of channel to do a lot of training so we've got a well it was in person until I guess next year is going to be virtual, but we're doing some online trainings. We're still going to do a uh, casino marketing bootcamp. We'll switch to virtual as long as we have to and still try to create a great experience. But um, training is something that has been a very, very big core of ours. So what is a, a bootcamp? What is a casino marketing bootcamp? How long is it? What does it entail? So um, casino marketing bootcamp, you know, it came out of a conversation I had with somebody else who who was a speaker at a conference that I attended, and she she asked me, um, well, she said that she al al always ponders, you know, she does so much work to put together these presentations, and she wonders what happens to all the information that she has shared with casino marketers. And I told her, uh, because I've been a casino marketer at an operation, I said, I know exactly what happens. Everybody sits here and takes great notes because they just love everything that they're hearing, but then they go back and the real world crashes in on them. And all the ideas that they wanted to put into place tend to end up in a notebook at the bottom of a pile. Um, and so what we did was we developed Casino Marketing Bootcamp. It's two days. The first year we did a lot on uh, leadership and kind of thinking skills. Last year, we were really, really focused on the elements that casino marketers um, work with. And what we did was we we divide up all the responsibilities casino marketers have. We bring in subject matter experts. And I like to say that it's not a typical conference because while there are uh, presentations, we really um, keep the group small so that everybody can participate, so that everybody can put their two cents in, so that everybody feels comfortable saying, I don't get this or I'm having problems executing this. How can I do this better? And what we have found is that that small group becomes so dynamic and so special. Um, we did it the first year and I was just over the moon that we, number one, had a group of people that were willing to pay and take a gamble on us. And then, and then we were able to expand from there into the second year and now we're, gonna, we're in the middle, middle of planning the third year. I would say it wasn't much of a gamble because of the expertise that you developed over your career. I know you've worked at a few different casinos, but one in particular I want to drill in on because I think it is, um, as an outsider that's never worked there, one of the ultimate casinos uh, brands in the casino industry, and that's Win Casinos. And I know off camera we spoke and you said you were actually working alongside the founder of Win, Steve, Steve Wynn, um, for a few years. Why don't you talk about maybe your background um, if there's any experiences before Wynn that you want to touch on, but I'd love to drill into your experience at the Wynn Casino. You know, I have to say that although Wynn is obviously the big marquee of my casino experience, I've had the pleasure and the honor to work with a lot of different companies. Um, wait, that, that sounds like I was really bad at keeping a job. <laughs> but I've worked with Harris, <laughs> you know, Caesars before when it was known as Harris Entertainment. I um, left Wynn and worked at Isle Capri where I did some of the best work I think of my career. Um, but yeah, working at Wynn, when I got the opportunity, I really had to jump at it because it was the opportunity of a lifetime. When I was just starting in the casino business, people said to me, and I was starting in, in New Orleans in the riverboat side, and people from Las Vegas said, if you're gonna be in the casino industry, you have to work in the Mecca of the casino industry, which was Las Vegas. And not only did I get a chance to do that, but then I got, the chance to work with 
the person who everybody really associates or associated with Las Vegas for so many years. So I, I too worked at Harrah's. I still feel, because I worked at Harrah's before I turned to Caesars, so I still say I used to work at yeah. Harrah's, not Caesars. I think they were great, at least when I was there, at, at customer service. Like I thought they had an amazing job of instilling just uh, great customer service, and they really built a lot of processes and structure around that. And I felt like that was their brand when I was there. It was just the friendly, great customer service place. And then when, maybe I'd, I'd love to hear, actually it'd be better you describe the brand that maybe Steve and you helped them craft because from the outside, it was like, man, Wynn just epitomized luxury and just high-end experience. And it was just so cool. I don't know. Like, I, I just felt like if I could afford to go there, I would be treated like a king and just feel awesome. So maybe you could describe what was your impression of Steve's vision and how did you help implement it? Well, you know, I think it's interesting that you um, mentioned the service culture at Harrah's. I think in retrospect, I think that, so absolutely, you know, Gary and all of the great marketers at Harris Entertainment knew that if we could move, you know, our, our approval ratings, just that little, you know, 10th of a point, it meant a lot of revenue for us. And so they did develop a lot of processes around service, fast and friendly. Remember, that was what we were great yep. on. Um, I think it win it was less process and more of a culture. You know, Steve was, um, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't talk to him now, so I don't know if this is still his, his, his interest, but he was always really interested in what people were thinking and what they were doing and what they liked. I mean, he would go up to people and say, what is that drink you're having? You know, because it, it, it would just be something different for him. And, um, and I think that that curiosity uh, was a lot of, about the Win brand. So it really wasn't, um, yeah, it was luxury. And I think that after Bellagio, it, there was little way that he could develop something that wouldn't be as luxurious. Um, but I think that the curiosity was just the, the, the biggest element of Win. You know, it, it, architecturally, it was designed for the curious. There were always just like little moments. Um, that Roger Thomas and Derrida Butler would put into the design that were just so unique and special. And I think that um, as as employees, we were able to enjoy the environment. So it was really, it was really kind of, you know, just kind of hugging you in this curious kind of plane. I, I like the way you described it. And I think with Steve, again, as somebody that never worked for him, but I've definitely geeked out and like watched a ton of speeches of him talking because I just admire him as an entrepreneur a lot. It wasn't like he was creating this luxurious brand because he just wanted it, he wanted to charge more. It felt like he was very curious about like, what do people want? What makes them feel special? And the things that, because he talks about like, yeah, sure, our building is amazing and I have all this fine art, but it's not, that's not what makes our brand so great. It's the experience people have. And um, yes, and maybe it was the result of not saying, what's the most expensive piece of art I can put up here? It's more just, you know, what are people like? What's gonna, what's the drink that's gonna make them feel good? What's the uh, vibe or like, I'm, I'm not being very concise with what I'm thinking, but it's not like here, we're gonna use this type of metal because it'll let us charge $20 extra per room is more like what's gonna make people feel better. So I think that the question was more about what's going to what's going to make people want to spend their money with us because mm -hmm. they could easily have gone to Venetian, they could easily have gone to Bellagio if they were looking for a $250 a night room rate, right? Um, it was what was going to make it a little bit different and make you um, choose that. But you know, um, everything had a story. You know, I remember we had these giant vases that were sitting out front in front of uh, Paul Bartolotta's restaurant when we opened up. And uh, when Roger Thomas had found those, and Roger Thomas w has been the designer at Wind Design for eons. Um, he's now doing a lot of um, great design on his own. But when he found these two vases, one of them had, they were old, and one of them had a love letter in them 
from the woman who apparently was sending these vases to her husband and she stuck a, a love letter in one of them and for years nobody had discovered it. So I mean just little moments like that are just it made our story like we told stories and I think that reporters were like y'all are making that up. <laughs> now wasn't that part of the win company culture or a process where storytelling was something that was done like at the start of every shift or I remember hearing something about that where they were looking for great customer service stories to elevate. Well, I think that, um, you know, when we opened up, uh, you know, we were all like drinking our own Kool-Aid, right? Until you open up and people start really experiencing and all of a sudden, you know, this isn't working, that's not working that, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of pressure when you first open up. And um, so Artie Nathan, who led uh, the human resources effort, you know, he, and Andrew Pascal developed a customer service program. So that that was part of, you know, we had to sort of like take people's, our own team members' minds off of like the stuff and and bring them back to the to the customer, to the center of what we were doing. And so there there were, I mean, most casinos do that, pre-shift meetings. Um, it's just a matter of how you you handle them. But yeah, I mean, Steve was very focused on the customer because he knew that if you delivered a great experience, the revenue would follow. So it was a it it was about putting the you know the cart and then the horse rather than the horse and then the cart. And I know we're I promise we're gonna move on beyond beyond Steve Wynn, but I think I told you I named one of my kids Wynn. That's how like <laughs> big of a fan I am of the brand and, and him as an entrepreneur. So we'll, last question, I think. Um, Steve Wynn had a reputation sort of like Steve Jobs as a creative genius that uh, wasn't necessarily easy to work for. Um, and you could say that probably about a lot of top coaches in NFL or college football that none of them that are winning Super Bowls are necessarily nice guys when you're, you know, they, they, they know how to crack the whip and know how to get the most out of their employees. So um, was that the experience you had with Steve Wynn? And how do you think that helped you grow as a professional and ultimately with Jay Carpoon Associates? Well, I have to tell you that the experience working with Win with Steve and working directly with him can, can be heaven and hell and sometimes at the same time. So um, I, I think that it was different for everybody. I mean, he has he has had uh, folks that worked with him from the very beginning. I mean, they just had a, a really great relationship. I mean, for me, I was just an outsider. And so I had to build a relationship and and he had to get to know me and he had to gain confidence in me, which I I feel like he did, um, but but he was um, he always uh, we used to have this thing because he always had this this vision, as as uh, a friend of mine used to say, you know, vision with the big V, um, and he would see things and I wouldn't see them and then you know all of a sudden I turn around I'd go, oh he was right and so. Um, it, I think that one of the things I had to learn was to get out of my own way. I mean, I think that I, I think that everybody grew from the experience. How you grew and how much you grew was very different, but it was a, a, a unique environment. I mean, you can't say that it that you could replicate that anywhere else. So branding a lot of your career that's been the common thread is branding. And you did mention that you have some clients that are outside the casino industry. What would you say? is the difference between branding in the casino industry versus branding of say consumer products or any any other industry? Well, I think it's it's just that. It's products, it's stuff versus an experience. Um, you know, we we have to as an industry, that's what we're marketing. We can't we can't find ourselves marketing slots because everybody's got slots. All the competitors have slots and more than likely they have the same ones as you or they have better newer ones because you just don't have the capital to bring in, you know, new titles. So um, it's really about that experience. And it's and it's also um, going for that disposable discretionary dollar. And, you know, today that dollar, that bucket is getting smaller and smaller as we sit out of work and working from home and so I think that that's the, the you know the biggest difference the other thing too the thing that's very unique about the casino industry I find is that switching costs is very low it costs nothing for a customer to say you know what I'm going to spend my $25 or my $100 at 
this casino instead of this one. And it's because they got a better offer because, so you have to make connections. I think that are, um, that are really emotionally based. And so they have to be very, very strong. How do you make those connections? Well, and may I'll phrase it a different way. Like if you see, you come into a market and you see two different casinos and there's one that's doing, how can you tell one that's doing a great job with their branding and building those emotional connections versus one that is not? What are some of the differences you see? So, you know, there's, a, I mean, it's really easy to, to look at the, at what I call the type the top of the iceberg, that service manifestation, the advertising and the logo and the creative and everything. Um, I mean, you see a lot when you look at that. Sometimes you see that they're exactly the same, which is a problem because that means that nobody really has a distinct brand or somebody does and the other one's just really copying it. Um, the other thing that we generally look at, I mean, we always encourage doing research. Talking to your customers is the best thing you could do for your brand and you should do it consistently and regularly. Um, but we also look at the internal piece and the employees and what they are getting, what they understand of the brand. Because sometimes you've got marketing um, with great ideas and great thoughts and great concepts, but somehow your, your line employees are give, singing a different tune. And it could be for a variety of reasons. And a lot of times it's because we tend to not um, communicate that very well with, with our team members and we don't communicate that with our team members our guests will never find that connection because that's where their brand connection is coming it's with those line employees and i think some casinos or actually a lot of companies in general may think like a whole you know hanging the pic uh, a picture that has their core values in the cafeteria yeah. is enough to translate that but it sounds like the companies that are really good at it are doing a deeper level what, what does that look like so interesting that you say that we're actually um we've got a webinar i didn't mean to to use the podcast as a plug but we do have a webinar coming up on the 12th um that we're going i'm doing with mira rosser who used to be with jacobs entertainment and we're talking about internal branding and kind of the things that you can do because that is what happens we we you know take a, our missions and you know value statements and make a poster and put it back a house and call it a day but there's more than that right there's how the leadership acts are they you know walking the walk talking the talk are they just like you know sending out memos um you have to really know also i think um you know there's always my i had used to have a boss that used to call it the donut strategy that hole in the middle was those supervisors so you got your executives that really get the brand and they're all into it, but then it filters down to the supervisors who don't get it. So then it never makes it down to the to the line employees. So there's a, a lot that um, there are a lot of missing links that I think we don't always notice. And I think one of the strongest things you could do is really form a relationship between HR and marketing. They really should be working together on this. Interesting. And that relationship between HR and marketing just has more people kind of explaining what the brand is and having conversations about what the brand is and that eliminates that gap in the donut you know it it really is it I mean it really depends on the company because you've got large companies you've got small companies and sometimes sometimes you've got these two departments and think about how critical they are to the brand and they don't even see each other unless it's you know an executive meeting you talked to a minute ago about you come into a market, sometimes you see casinos where their branding and their messaging are basically identical. And that's not smart from a branding perspective, especially if you're the one of those two that is maybe a further drive from the metropolitan area or, or you know, older has, or smaller. So how do you identify when you're when you're coming into a new client and you're trying to figure out what what's the message we need to focus on that will get people to drive further? or play at an older casino, how do you identify what that differentiating strength is? So I tell you what, we um, we started doing this with a with a client um, in the Northwest. And you know, the first thing we did was we sat with the executive team. We really kind of sat with them and said, where's your head with this? What do you think you are? What do you, you know, where, what are you hanging your hat on? And then the next step was to talk to um, the customers and to talk to team members. And then see kind of, you know, are they three different circles? Are they overlapping a bit? Um, and then looking at the competitive um, market and really looking at it from an outside perspective. 
um, because I think that, um, again, we tend to drink our own Kool-Aid and, you know, nobody wants to be told that their baby is ugly, so to speak. My friend Daryl said that one time. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I find things like SWOT analysis, you know, sometimes I'll read SWOT analysis and I'm like, really? You think that? Okay. You know, <laughs> so, and a lot of times we'll do the research and we'll have um, folks who really aren't part of marketing because uh, sit in on the research because sometimes they really do need to hear a customer behind a two-way mirror say these words and i'm i've been in many of those moments where you know the table games guy goes i had no idea or or the hr person you know or you know so we always try to invite more than just marketing to these research um times so that because i think that they get a lot out of it so these conversations with the executive team different people up and down in the organization um, help you identify what they feel like is their strength that they're proud of. And then you use that to, uh, you craft new messages that emphasize that? Or well, if we that? need to, like I, I, branding isn't always about throwing out what you're doing. Sometimes you just need to like polish it up a little bit and try to, you know, give it a little bit more um, connection. And so, yeah, we do identify kind of the opportunities. It's it, it this whole process kind of creates a new SWOT analysis, right? So then we we realize where our strong points are, where our weaknesses are, where our opportunities are, and then from there we can see how that matches up to what we're delivering and what we're saying, and then find a way to bring them together. So the branding is one of those things that everybody knows is you need, and you need to invest in it proving the return on investment in branding is always difficult, if right. not impossible. So how do you, I mean, how do, what are some ways marketers have come up with to kind of justify an investment in branding? Because again, clearly it's valuable. It's just it's one of those things that are tough to quantify like a response rate on a free play offer or something. Well, I mean, there's, a, from, a, from an advertising perspective, you know, we talk about um, when you're doing branding and you're creative, how you can uh, measure, you know, uh, that top box score. You know, when you ask people to recall a casino, is your casino coming up in the, you know, in the first two unaided? Um, and so it's always good to kind of like understand what your awareness is in the market and then see if you have made a difference. But at the end of the day, the thing you have to measure is the revenue. And, and yeah, branding is a bit of a longer play so you know you have to have a team that's willing to go into this and understand that uh, you know going through these brand exercises isn't necessarily going to make a change for you in this in this month or this quarter but yeah you should have some kind of measurement that you're going to that you're going to see has all of this made a difference to us and a lot of times when you go through your branding it starts to ch shift your operation you know because then you have to ask yourself, is your operation matching up to the brand? Things like, I don't know, like if you're a value, uh, if you're if you're a value based brand um, against a brand new, shiny, more luxurious brand, are you charging pre COVID, you know, twenty four ninety nine for your budget or twelve ninety nine? Right, so. And if you're charging twenty four ninety nine, is your is your buffet worth thirty five dollars? So it's a value, right? It, value is not necessarily about a number; it's a relationship to the dollar that people are putting out there. And so I think you do have to understand kind of the brand and how it impacts the operation as well. Now we talked about the um, internal brand, like to employees, obviously external to customers. How much? Do people consider do your clients or just in the industry in general the brand towards their stakeholders, whether it's if it's a public company, their shareholders, or very common tribal casinos where it's the tribal members that ultimately kind of decide who the management is? Like, how much does that even come up? Or, well, I think that when you talk about brand, you're talking about all your stakeholders, right? So your team yes. members, your vendors, your investors, your executive team, and your your guests. So I think it, it has to come up. It has to be something that, that investors say, um, we understand this brand and we see how it can grow and this is a good investment for us. 
and they're doing all the right things because they're saying this is what they are and that's how they're operating. Now, when COVID-19 started to take hold, casinos were shut down. I remember talking with um, you know somebody, real smart person in marketing that I remember they're having a debate about putting the brand on a face mask and if that would create a bad association with the brand because it's on a face mask. And then you see other casinos that are, you know, had billboards, I think, with masks on it. I, there's a funny play. I think I think Choctaw Duran up here did a funny um, billboard that had a mask on it. So obviously a lot of different casinos were, um, you know, doing a lot of different things with COVID-19. What has, you know, what have you seen as a brand marketer? How has COVID-19 affected branding and what are some yeah just i want to hear your perspective on that so um casino marketers will put a logo on anything that doesn't move fast enough to get out of the way (laughs) (laughs) and it's gonna be a big logo too by the way (laughs) (laughs) um but i think that i think that branding sort of had to take a has naturally taken a back seat right now because we have to really concern ourselves with keeping our team members and our guests as safe as possible. I mean, that is what everybody needs to do right now. So unfortunately for us, it has taken a bit of a back seat, but ultimately I think that as, um, as things are starting to become more normal, I mean, I look at, I look at myself and how, at the very beginning, I was wearing a mask. I hated wearing a mask. I knew I had to wear a mask and I was fine wearing the mask, except I it was so frustrated. I mean, it was just kind of making me crazy. And, you know, I took, I've taken two trips now and I've had to wear a mask for like six hours. So it, it, that's become my newer normal, right? And, and things may shift. And I think that we're gonna be um, in this safety mode for a while. So when that starts to feel more normal to people, I mean, think about in Asia, they started wearing masks without a problem because it's sort of become part of their culture after SARS, right? Mm -hmm. Was it SARS that became, or the bird flu? Yep. That um, it sort of became, you saw people all the time, Asian people always wearing masks. It was like not a big deal. And I think that um, when things start to get normal in consumers' minds, when they start to feel like this is the way things are going to be, brand has to be there for them to find their their place because now all things are gonna be equal. Mm-hmm. I've heard some people, what is it? Like brand is like, like personal brand is like your reputation. Um, and like what brand is how somebody would describe you. Is that, would you say that that's accurate? Like if, how, is that an effective way to measure a brand? Is like, you just ask customers, like how would you describe this casino or what? You know, what um, ways to do brand research to, so I leave the questions to Mike Metzka, who who I've done a ton of, of work with. Um, but I know that when I work with um, with the executive teams or with uh, team members, I'll go through some of the things like that and say, if if this if your brand, you know, if Casino X was your friend and you were hanging out at a bar and you ran into another friend, how would you introduce them? I like that. Right. And so um, sometimes putting that kind of uh, perspective makes people think about the brand a little bit differently. So we, we do that in some of our exercises. I mean, we've got a couple of other exercises that we do, but that one seems to, to be kind of fun for folks. So real marketing, a book you wrote recently, tell us about real marketing. So, um, I have to say that I had this kind of dream to write a book for a number of years and then never got around to it. And then the quarantine sort of made me say, well, I don't have anything else going on. So I might as well tackle this. But um, it really, it really kind of grew into something that I wasn't expecting. Um, as I started pulling things together, I started to to realize that I kind of had this this methodology that I've always used, which are our five um, pillars of brand marketing, and and I had these stories that kind of fell into those pillars. Um, part of the book too also has at the end of the chapters we have uh, little assignments, and they're not really like homework, but they're really a great way for you to think about your brand and and under those five pillars. So um, I was happy to, to to finally get it published. And, you know, there's there was nothing out there for casino brand marketing folks. And and I thought that it, there's an empty space. It's something that I love and I love sharing the information. You know, like I said, teaching was one of our core values. So 
And where can people get a copy of Real Marketing? Uh, it's on the Kindle platform. So it's Kindle and then a paperback on Amazon. Well, Juliet, is there anything I forgot to ask you that would be interesting to talk about? No, I'm so happy to speak about casino brands because, like, as you know, as I said, it's taking a back seat right now. But I think that it's going to be something we need to really kind of refocus on. Well, Julia, I know a lot of casinos are going to have some big improvements in their brand thanks to you and Jay Carcamo and Associates. And so thank you so much for carving out some time to talk to me today. Thank you. I appreciate the time. And before we go, how can people get a hold of you if they want to talk branding? Oh, well, uh, you can find my email address at our website, jcarcamoassociates.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Uh, we have a Facebook group for casino marketers called Casino Marketing Masters. Uh, we've got a lot of channels. We love to talk. <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you again so much, Julia, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.